does EPIC, the satellites that you're going to start launching, I believe in January, mm -hmm. um, do you have some uh, built-in um, jam-resistant qualities to that, or is that something that um, requires uh, some sort of commitment from the government that you then add that in, or does it in and of itself, based on the technology that, that, that enables this uh, high throughput capability, does that provide some measure of protection in and of itself? So the EPIC series of satellites that Inelsat is launching starting in January will move us up that continuum, again, if you can keep picturing that, that continuum of, of anti-jam. And again, as Winston and I spoke before, we, we, we might be reaching and adding those features and reaching those conclusions in our satellite design for very different reasons, but they accomplish the same, the same end objective. So just a couple ways that that's happening when you, on these high throughput satellites, by definition, your beam is what used to be a wide beam, picture a beam covering the whole continental United States, now just covers a couple of states or maybe just one state. So your jammer actually has to be inside that beam, right? So by definition, we have now greatly reduced the, the uplink jamming capability of our adversaries. The other thing that, that all of us are adding are different types of digital switches and channelizers and that also allows us to do, you know, any connection to any connection. It allows us to null out jammers, you know, and so there are definitely anti-jam features as part of the EPIC series, and we will continue to evolve those features, all of us will, where it makes commercial sense. And this is where it's really important to understand and have the dialogue, where are we going to go as industry just because it makes sense to do that from a market perspective, and where does the threat need us, take us to. And that's the dialogue and could be a great pathfinder where the DOD says, okay, you guys are going to get, move up along that continuum, but you're not going quite as high as we want you to go, so here's something we're going to invest in on your system. Go deploy that additional protection feature. Those are the kinds of things that we're, that we're talking about. SES has a 53 satellite uh, fleet at, at uh, GEO. Um, we design our satellites for 15 years but we replenish at about year 12. So when we look at our overall launch schedule, we look at roughly three satellites per year for the foreseeable future. What that means is we have the ability to insert technology on future satellites uh, you know, 30 months from now and being able to go ahead and take advantage of that. Our HTS capabilities, much like uh, you heard about EPIC, are going to have the beam forming, spot beam, beam forming, um, and, and some of the key features that really do help you uh, avoid that uplink jamming. Um, you know, if the U.S. government were to say, we need downlink encryption, we also employ uplink encryption, uh, NSA approved Caribou Type 1 uplink encryption for TTNC, but if, if the U.S. government were to say for a Pathfinder, we want to go ahead and employ downlink encryption and showed us the demand signal and showed us the, uh, the idea that we could go ahead and do that maybe with some modest investment, we'd take that on. And I, I think we have the opportunity here with your leadership to go ahead and do things in record time. Um, we, we signed a couple of hosted payload opportunities with the FAA and with NASA earlier this spring, and from contract award to on-orbit capabilities, about 30 months. You can't, I don't see that with a normal program of record like WGS. So we have the ability, as Kay was mentioning, to be innovative. We can take on these technology insertion programs, and we don't necessarily even need to be subsidized for that. We can do this as something that we think is important, but we need the demand signal and the dialogue to know what to do.